I would genuflect, except I can't anymore. No, I don't. <laughs> One of the things of old age, let me get my phone out, in case the Pope calls, which he won't. Uh, but at least the talk's really boring, so I can at least watch messages pop up now and then. So I want to thank uh, the organizers at this event, and most especially Father Brendan Fitzgerald, for inviting me to speak to all of you today on a topic near and dear to my heart, namely Vatican II, the universal call to holiness, and the charism of Dorothy Day as it relates to that. I am honored to be here today, and I hope my words can shed some light on our current situation, which is in many ways a situation of crisis, both in the Church and in the broader culture of the West. I pray that the Holy Spirit will guide my reflections today and keep me from being a blooming idiot, which, if left to my own devices, I most surely would be. My reflections today will cover Dorothy Day, Vatican II, the universal call to holiness, modern culture, and an analysis of where Dorothy Day fits into all of that. Can I cover all of that in 45 minutes? No. Uh, so hold on, this should be a wild ride as I go along here quickly. Let me begin then by saying that I'm not here today to give an infomercial on Dorothy Day in order to impart to you the basic facts of her life and what she stood for. I'm not here to sell you on Dorothy Day like a huckster on TV trying to sell you an air fryer or a chicken rotisserie machine. I'm here rather to alarm you and to embed my discussion of Dorothy Day within that alarm. It is not good enough to just lay out the facts of her life and her message in a purely academic manner, feigning some kind of scholarly objectivity that is above the fray. It is not good enough because it can leave you with the impression that her message is something we can take or leave as simply one point of view among many. I am not here, in other words, to describe the Dorothy Day option. I am here to discuss the Dorothy Day mandate. In order to adequately describe, however, her ongoing significance for our times, I need to begin by establishing the nature of the crisis I think we face. Because only when we diagnose the disease can we prescribe the proper cure. In a nutshell, the crisis we face is the crisis presented to us by modernity and the Church's flawed response, yes, flawed response to modernity, both on the right wing and on the left. The term modernity is, of course, a very plastic term that can mean many things to different people. I am using it here today to denote the culture that arose in Western culture in the Enlightenment, which was then followed by the scientific and industrial revolutions and the rise of modern political liberalism and democracy. This has led to a culture which lives entirely on the horizontal axis of existence and which defines reality in purely mundane and horizontalist terms. It is a culture, to use the term of the scholar Charles Taylor, that lives entirely within the imminent frame, with no explicit linkages to transcendence as a point of social reference as something publicly real and significant. Popes John Paul and Benedict have named this reality as well and refer to it as the eclipse of God in our culture. And by the eclipse of God, they, don't, they do not mean a simple rise in the number of atheists and agnostics, since all cultures of all times have always had their fair share of those. Rather, what they meant is something far deeper, far more aboriginal and more cataclysmic. What they meant was that what I call the nullification of the very question of God as a meaningful public reality. The nullification, in other words, of the legitimacy of transcendence as a conceptual category as such, followed then by its reduction to a mere epiphenomenal eruption of conflicting emotional states rooted in the psychology of our evolutionary past. In other words, modernity tra tra would define transcendence away as a category that is not pointing to something real and salutary, but something rather that is neurotic and dangerous and grounded in our simian desire to mark our territory and our reptilian desire to stay warm in the cold. This is modernity, and it is this reality that theologian hans Urs von Balthasar referred to simply as the system. He viewed it as a hegemonic and latently totalitarian attempt to circumscribe what counts as the really real, 
within the strict boundaries of an intra-worldly prison of material relations. Dorothy Day understood it in exactly this way as well, modernity, and her entire apolitical politics was grounded in this analysis. To cite several paradig paradigmatic examples of this, we see for starters, for example, that Dorothy's anarchism was not an antinomian rejection of the moral law, but a rejection instead of the true antinomianism that is the Leviathan of the modern nation state, with its claim to a monopoly and all the means of social coercion and its claim to metaphysical neutrality, which is, of course, utter nonsense. In fact, it scarcely rises to the level of nonsense. Her pacifism was a rejection of the inherent violence and militarism that is absolutely necessary for these antinomian states to survive. Since absent a leak to transcendence as the ground of the good, there remains only relations of power, conceived of in terms of pure force. We speak a lot of human and civil rights, and the liberal order is putatively grounded in such an affirmation. But these rights, if you look closely at them, are not linked to a notion of the good, to transcendence, but are purely stipulative and somewhat arbitrary and change quickly as the cultural mood changes. And since such rights are not grounded in any deep-seated rationale once they are stipulated, they must be policed and imposed by force. This then is the final move towards violence, which Dorothy opposed, since as the late Italian philosopher Augusto del Noce points out, isn't that a great, I wish I was named Augusto del Noce, but as he points out, the essence of all totalitarianism resides in the subjugation of culture to politics, which requires periodic war making in order to bleed the lines of the excess pressure that is built up within the social matrix caused by the re resolution of cultural fractiousness precisely by the path of coercive power. War, in other words, war making in modernity is state making. They justify each other. Her, and, and thus Dorothy, her pacifism is rooted in that. Her voluntary poverty and work for the poor was along with embracing the dominical commandments to feed the poor, a rejection of the cult of bourgeois capitalist well-being. Here she followed Nicholas Berdyaev, among others, and today finds a resonance in folks like Eugene McCarraher at Villanova, whose magisterial tome, The Enchantments of Mammon, deftly scopes out the almost mystical character of modern wealth creation as the greatest totem in the modern pantheon of the strong gods of blood and soil. Her voluntary poverty was thus not a white-knuckle asceticism ordered to a denial of the very good things of this earth, but a prophetic critique of the modern worship of mammon, which is itself linked to the worship of Moloch, the god of death. John Paul preferred to, referred to this as the culture of death, and he was not speaking vaguely or metaphorically. Thus, Dorothy's voluntary poverty, far from being a world-hating asceticism, was a life-affirming practice intended to break the chains of our mammon Moloch idolatry. In other words, Dorothy Day was no mere do-gooder or just a radical philanthropist with Jesus sprinkles on top of the ice cream of her social work. She was a prophet and she was a pain. And she was the irritant in the oyster that creates the pearl, which in this case is the pearl of great price, which is the holiness that living the gospel brings. And she shares with Balthazar as well this Christocentric vision of the crucified Lord, the lamb who was slain from all eternity and who stands in opposition to this system, the system, which is really at the end of the day what the book of Revelation is all about. All apocalyptic is the response to all intramundane imminent frames since it smashes the categories of a strict imminence with the message of the inbreaking of the crucified lamb who now exists beyond the perfidies and pretensions of the world and stands athwart them in judgment. Ours, therefore, according to Dorothy Day, is an era of crisis in the strict sense, which means that point in time when we are forced to choose or against Christ, what Balthasar called the Ernstfall in German. It denotes, in other words, a choice that cannot be avoided since not to choose is in fact a choice in favor of the status quo of the system. The metric for a Christian of all truth is the lamb who was slain. And this metric of truth, both worldly and supernatural, 
though hidden under the varnished layers of violence in human and ecclesial history, must be the cruciform pattern of our existence, according to Dorothy. Put another way, what I am claiming is that Dorothy Day's significance can only be understood against the backdrop of what Balthazar called the Anstfall crisis of choice that she believed was upon all of us and which could not be avoided. Constantinian Catholicism is dead. Cultural Catholicism is dead. We are now returned to the pagan realm of the morally indifferent, as I said, strong gods of Blut und Erde. And therefore she understood that only a return to a radical form of Christian existence can save us. All attempts at compromise with the bourgeois cult of well-being and its technocratic capitalist engine will fail and have failed, which is why the church, having attempted just such a compromise over the past couple hundred years, has become a safe space of non-triggering velvet saints whose icons ooze the oil of Laodicea. We have lost the Constantinian church, but we have never really lost our desire to retrieve it. And thus we fret over our relevance in very puerile ways, like an adolescent seeking affirmation from his or her peers, and thus tut-tutting at those like Dorothy and Balthazar for your rigorous utopians out of touch with reality. But the reality so defined is the reality of bourgeois well-being, which militates against the universal call to holiness, which many in the church today consider a subspecies of fanaticism. And right she was about this condition we are in. Wohin ist Gott? Nietzsche asked. Where is God? Ich will es euch sagen. I, I will tell you. Gott ist tot. God is dead. Und Gott bleibt tot. And God will remain dead. Und wir sind seine Mörder, ihr und ich. And we are as murderers, you and I. Aber ist dieses Ton nicht so groß für uns? Nein, nein. Is that not too great a deed for us? No, no. And he says no twice. The later thinkers in the Enlightenment, like Nietzsche, understood that the Enlightenment tradition was already too tame, too domesticated, with the boundaries of classical culture, morality, and reason. They understood that Gott ist tot, God is dead, culturally speaking. Nietzsche, of course, didn't believe that there was once a God and he died somehow. He believed that he, God didn't exist and he only existed culturally, and that culture was dead, and he was right about that. And thus do we get the modern masters of hermeneutical suspicion in his wake, in people like Marx and Freud as well, who held that all love is veiled lust, all reason veiled power, and all justice veiled revenge. Therefore, modern Titanism must deconstruct such social illusions as the mere recrudescence of mystification and superstition. Thus is modernity characterized, as noted once again by Del Noce, by the mantra now become a dogma, quote, today it is no longer possible to think the following anymore. In other words, all that was before modernity is thus erased in order for the binding address that was transcendence to be eliminated. Modern political liberalism, with its de facto atheistic core, has as its chief goal the elimination of all such binding addresses, other than that of the state, or put another way, other than that of the system. C.S. Lewis, great Anglican divine, once famously used the analogy of an egg to describe the necessity today of making the choice for or against Christ. He said that spiritually speaking, we are all eggs, and like eggs, we must, we must either hatch or go bad. His point is, as Dorothy's, there is no stasis. There is no standing still. To choose, that is to choose, to choose that, to choose stasis is to choose spoilage and death. We must either hatch or go bad. I get emails all the time from former students of mine who are now parents and who are suffering through the fact that very few of their children remain believers. They ask me, what can we do to stop this? And the statistics today about young people in the Catholic Church are sobering and bear this out as a general trend. Millions of young people are simply walking away from the faith. <coughs> we are hemorrhaging young people. Why is this? As Dorothy would point out, and she did, it is because the church has kicked the can of decisional crisis down the road, refused to take a strong countercultural stand in defiance to the system, and has put its head in the sand and opted for status quo, don't rock the boat, thinking. The church has opted to make the parish safe for the culture of the cul-de-sac, and has thus neutered its eschatological essence at its roots, rendering the church so dull and lackluster that it is in no way any longer compelling. 
by the way. We heard such beauty here today. Where is that in your average parish? And we wonder why our children see nothing of value then in it, why it all must seem so inauthentic and boilerplate to them. Much of the church in the West has become the sock puppet of modern culture, but the problem with sock puppets is that they all look the same. The church should be a hatchery for holiness, which was the point Dorothy Day and Peter Morin, the co-founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, made over and over and over, but it has instead become a place for warehousing the spoiled eggs of our mediocrity. We have told folks that they can have their cake and eat it too. They can take on the coloration and values of our culture and still be good Catholics. And I suppose we can in some sense, but for how long? The bourgeois center does not hold, as all the statistics prove. Only the Christological, Christological center will hold, and that was Dorothy's point, especially when the Catholic culture is lost, and all that is left is the decisional choice. You say I'm being hyperbolic and alarmist in an overly harsh and hortatory tone. I have a priest friend, I'm very hortatory. Right? I have a priest friend who was a pastor in New Hampshire, went to seminary with him. Yeah, I used to be a seminary, I didn't make it, all right? He was a priest in 1985, when he, it was a small diocese ago, I won't say, you know, it's up in New Hampshire. 185 active priests when he was started in 1985. Now there are 50. The number of baptisms and marriages has imploded, let alone confirmations. Think of your own families. How many of you are old enough to have grown children as well as nephews and nieces can honestly say that most of them are still Catholic? I know in my own family that this question cannot be answered in the affirmative. Most of my nephews and nieces, non-practicing. What does all of this, I think actually, all of them non-practicing. What does all of this have to do with Dorothy Day and Vatican II? In a word, everything. What I'm trying to establish is that the status quo of the modus vivendi we have worked out with bourgeois culture is finally unraveling and is being exposed for the shell game that it was. And in its place, we're being offered several flawed alternatives. We have the toxic romanticism of radical traditionalism, a traditionalism often tainted, by the way, with misogyny and anti-Semitism which is also a traditionalism also bound to a most people are going to hell approach to salvation and a narrow reading of the necessity of the church for salvation. So most people are going to hell, according to some of these neo-traditionalists, which, which is why they hate Vatican II and Balthazar and Bishop Barron, not to mention Dorothy Day and me. You should see my email. Whew, scathing. There's also the neoconservative fantasy camp of a crypto-Catholic America just waiting for the Catholic moment to emerge as the spiritual prop for American exceptionalism and militarism in some fever dream of a natural law reading of the Constitution that exchanges ecclesial patristics with the patristics of America's blessed founding. There is the increasingly influential and resurgent Catholic progressivism that is little more than a Catholic theological front group for blessing the sexual revolution. You know, at one time, the Catholic left, when I was young, I'm 63, when I was young, 60s and 70s, the left, left-wing Catholics were actually interesting and engaging, anti-war, anti-poverty, anti-state. Now it all cares about our proper pronouns. The face of the Catholic left has changed, and it has offered us very little other than blessing the sexual revolution. And so we are presented with several ecclesial alternatives, all of which are dead ends. We are at a series of dead ends, all of which engage in ideologically motivated mystifications that occlude the cruciform nature of our true existence. Dorothy Day understood this, which is why she railed against the clericalization of holiness and the relega relegation of the Sermon on the Mount to the status of councils of perfection, which you need not follow as a layperson. Day understood that Jesus too was considered a rigorist in his day, as can be seen in his disciples' disbelief that the rich young ruler was sent away by Jesus because he would not give up his wealth. Mammon, money being then, as it is now, a marker of divine blessing. Just ask Kenneth Copeland, he'll tell you. And openly asked Jesus, his disciples then openly asked Jesus, well, if this rich dude can't be saved, who can be saved? Look at that mentality. Who then can be saved? Dorothy Day was not deterred by accusations of rigorism since she saw, I mean she really just saw with profound prophetic clarity that we must either hatch or go bad. She saw that a radicalization had to happen. She saw we had to either ascend 
or we would descend. We are either looking up towards God or we're looking at our veins or our gut or someplace else. And so she insisted that the only thing that can save us is what she called a revolution of the heart, where the small band of Catholics that will remain are truly intentional and evangelical in their faith. And this realization was not unique to Dorothy, no less a light than Joseph Ratzinger, future Pope Benedict, stated already in 1967 that the church must accept the fact that she is going to become much, much smaller in the near future, since there are Though there are few who will make the decisional choice and will choose instead to float downstream with the culture. And he thus concluded, as Dorothy concluded, that the only Catholicism that will remain is the Catholicism of those who consciously choose it in the face of cultural obstacles. Thus Dorothy Day and Peter Morn were not joking around or being cheeky when they said that today the living out of the Sermon on the Mount was no longer an option for the elite few, but must be the choice of all. We must be radical or we won't be at all. Or as Karl Rahner, the great theologian, once said, the Christian of the future will be a mystic or he won't be at all, he or she. It is against this background that I would like now to discuss the true significance of Vatican II and show how this buttresses the claim made by Dorothy and Peter that holiness is no longer an option but a mandate for spiritual survival. The council had strengths, but it also had weaknesses. But in the end, it too represents a watershed moment that must be embraced critically but lovingly in the option it presents, namely, a more evangelical church, Christocentric in nature, and that Christocentrism and evangelicalism is the engine of holiness for everyone. So before we place Dorothy Day in this context, we need to discuss the council a bit. Vatican II, not just by my view, but by the view of just about every pope since then, it was a missionary council. It was not a modernizing or liberalizing council as the popular media both then and now would have us believe. Oh yeah, Hans Kung had that wonderful hair, a fancy red sports car he did, drove it all over Rome, was the darling Swiss Wunderkind, ever ready to pronounce to a breathless and complicit media that the Catholic Church was in essence dissolving itself apparently. But this was not the voice of the council as such, nor in the other direction was the council inclined to engage in a pro forma reiteration of the categories of neo-scholastic fortress Catholicism with its security bank blanket syllogisms and woefully inadequate caricatures of modern philosophy. Many in the Curia thought the council would last three months and be over by the end of the summer. All the schemata drafts had been drawn up and the hope was that the bishops would give it all a thumbs up and then dash off to Piazza del Rotundo for dinner and wine. But this too was not the will of the council. The council's vision was sweeping and broad. Its goal was to re-evangelize the world through a missionary effort that would take the church's vast spiritual riches and place them in the modern public square as genuine interlocutors with a world made weary by the genocidal wars of then recent memory and the emerging threat of nuclear apocalypse. But in order to do this, the Council Fathers knew that a purely clerical effort would not do, and that the time was now for a a lay revolution in the church. Very often in the history of the church, great spiritual leaders arose in the past to reform their religious orders, which often ended in them breaking away from the main body in order to found a more rigorous, what they call discoused, or without shoes, discoused movement of radical Catholicism. Discoused this, discoused that. Therefore, I like to say that in its universal call to holiness, the council was calling for a discoused laity, shorn of the spiritually contractual Catholicism so prevalent in the preconciliar church. They sought a more evangelical laity who would rise to the challenge of modernity and bring the gospel into the world in a radical way, but also in a way appropriate to the laity who must, after all, live in the world and provide for their families. Thus, I have often said that the heart and soul of the council can be seen in two things. First, it was a radically Christocentric council and sought the reformulation of all theology along Christocentric lines. And in so, you might think, oh, didn't that always happen? No. <laughs> Up until the Second Vatican Council, a lot of Catholic theology was very theocentric. It's, I don't want to get into too many of those distinctions, but not Christocentric enough. Second, it sought to take this message and, among other things, apply it to the universal call to holiness, which it sought to declericalize and to emphasize that it truly is a universal call meant for all. 
This was not a new doctrine in the church, but it had been muddied over with the sludge of a moribund clericalism and an infantilized laity. And this is no caricature. Something has to explain why the entire bottom fell out of the church's culture immediately after the council, and that explanation is easy to find. A church characterized by a rule-based clericalism and a contractual faith within the laity went wild after the council lifted the lid off of the ecclesiastical libido in the form of a softening of the rules in favor of an intentional choosing. In a church defined by the boundaries of mere rules, when those rules are at least perceived as being removed or softened, then the boundaries go away as well. Woohoo! no Fridays. We can have meat on Fridays. Look at that. And then as what we saw happen, ignored is, oh, you should do some other penance on Fridays. <laughs> no, no meat. Good, we can have meat now. Out the door. See, it's just rules. Rules change. Now it's all voluntary. I'm on that. The council was therefore right in its theology, but was guilty of a double pastoral naivete. The first naivete was that it overestimated the strength of the internal faith life of the church to that point. And the second naivete is that it underestimated the toxicity of modern culture to that same faith, and which was in great measure why the church had already been slowly rotted from within. As early as 1958, before the council, a young, to quote him again, a young Joseph Ratzinger penned a famous article that hit like a bombshell called the new heathenism or the new paganism in the church. And in that article, Ratzinger made the same observation I am making here, namely that despite the outward signs of strength to the contrary, the reality was that the church had been hollowed out from within and had largely imbibed the pagan values of modernity. It had become, in his words, a church of heathens who thought they were Christians. Others had noted this as well, and much earlier. You see it in literary figures like George Bernanos, whose Diary of a Country Priest was an exploration of the theme of the lonely holiness of a single priest within an ocean of Catholic boredom and disbelief, and that was written in the 30s. You saw it in historians like Christopher Dawson, who saw in the early 20th century the bourgeois Catholicism of his day as a moribund institution in an advanced stage of decay. Romano Guardini saw it, so did Etienne Gilson and Joseph Pieper, and a host of other great Catholic thinkers. My point here is that this thesis of a rotted preconciliar church is not some idiosyncratic theory of my own making. Therefore, the modern traditionalist belief by the rad trads, as they call them, that in order to overcome the post-conciliar turmoil, we simply need to go back to what things were like before the council is silly. It is absolutely silly. If Catholics were so happy and content with the form of Catholicism, that form, and its Latin liturgy, why did they so gladly, in an almost Dionysian orgy of cathartic libidinous release, toss it all aside in an instant without blinking twice or looking back? The problem, therefore, is that the council understood that the church needed holiness, but in its double naivete failed to spell out the exact kind of holiness that is needed today, and chose instead to speak in the vague platitudes of various theological bromides that had been drawn from the past. And in so doing, it failed to identify what kind of saints we need today, with any specificity tailored to the challenge of modern culture. In short, the council, though radical in many ways, was still trying to square the circle of material continuity in doctrine and practice in all things, and therefore had a tendency to articulate its message in church speak in order to smooth over the various micro-ruptures it was indeed introducing. Sure, the council got the theology right, but as Ratzinger noted years later, perhaps they were too focused on getting the theology right and not focused enough on what the concrete pastoral fallout would be. But in the council's defense, it was caught in a bind. On the one hand, she wanted to reject the defensive insular fortress Catholicism mentality of the preconciliar era. She wanted to combat the errors of modernity, but knew that she could not do so with the old neo-scholasticism and a syllabus of errors. On the other hand, she needed to counteract the errors of modernity, but wanted to do so positively by putting forward a better anthropology, a better humanism than that offered by modern culture. Think De Lubach's The Drama of Atheist Humanism, for example. It wanted to build on what was good in modernity without, for all that, offering up a pinch of incense to modernity's poly polyamorous idolatries. 
Sadly, the Catholics of today quite often have long since stopped obsessing over where our pinch of incense is directed, which is one of the chief points Balthazar makes. The choice, the church and the choice in both its clerical and lay domains made its peace with modern bourgeois mediocrity and its spiritually myopic materialism and settled into a long winter's nap of somnambulistic lassitude, content to sublate the monogamy of our devotion to Christ underneath a host of other penultimate desires, ethnicism, nationalism, consumerism, Americanism, treating Christ like an ancient palimpsest where the original image can only be recovered with great skill and effort by peeling away the layers of varnish. And so the bourgeois tale ends up wagging the Christian dog, which culminates in a thinly disguised rejection of sanctity, as I said before, as a subspecies of fanaticism. The universal call to holiness, championed by Vatican II, and presciently called for by Dorothy Day and Peter Morin already in the 1930s, is corrupted, inverted, and falsified by rendering the quest for holiness in ordinary life into its opposite. The statement that, quote, we can find holiness even in ordinary things is true, but it becomes to instead, it is holy to be ordinary. An ordinary is then defined strictly according to the structures of plausibility constructed by modernity. The claim of Dorothy and Peter Morin, therefore, was that the attempt to domesticate <coughs> our transformation in Christ through a thousand compromises with ordinary life is a form of idolatry. It is the idolatry of the everydayness that imposes itself upon us and insists upon our ascent to real life as opposed to the fanaticism of those who seek a kingdom not of this world. And it is an idolatry which in a previous form is as old as the Christian faith itself because the Romans accused the first Christians of being antisocial and anti-human. The original charge against the Christians was atheism by the Romans because they were contrary to the social order. And the social order was propped up by the gods and the Christians refused, and refused to, to worship them, all right? What the early church therefore by contracts dared its followers to do was to imagine what the Romans said was really real what it seems to be most everyday common sense realness is in fact an illusion. And it called us to dream differently and more radically. It is the inability to dream differently and to assert instead that this world and its logic of compromise is an end in itself that I define following Berdaev and Day and Morin as the bourgeois spirit. This spirit to the substitution of penultimate, ultimate realities for penultimate ones. This spirit has always been with us, but as Berdaev points out, beginning in the 19th century, it has been elevated into a strict and all-encompassing governing principle for our culture, religion, economics, and politics. We cannot imagine differently. This is the culture in which we live. We might think we can imagine differently, but only with great, great difficulty. Um, I'll go off script a little bit here, and with risk of going over a little bit. The fact of the matter is, there's a great talk these days of disaffiliation from the church, people, especially young people walking away from the church. And there's this great emphasis now on, well, well, they need better catechesis and there needs to be better theology. And that's all true. I'm a theologian. Far be it for me to say we don't need better theology or we don't need better catechesis. But we could throw a million catechism at people and we can throw a million theology textbooks at people. But they're not going to accept it unless their imaginative capacity is changed because what we ultimately believe isn't what necessarily what is in our mind conceptually we pursue what we desire which is the good and the good is something we primarily use our imagination to construct okay? and in our culture in our society who forms the imaginative matrix of how we desire the sociologist Rene Girard talks about mimetic desire, mimesis, a Greek word which means imitation. Okay? We don't desire what we desire because we desire, we tend to desire what others desire, and thus we imitate them. And there is where our imaginations are formed. The church needs, the church needs to kick against that goad, and it needs to form our imaginations differently. This is how we keep our children in the faith. We form their imaginations differently. We give them a counter world. We flip their script, a counter narrative. But Dorothy and Peter were charged with rigorism for saying that, but they persisted in the face of accusations of sectarian rigorism. And to the charge that they were utopian, purist, and rigorous, they promptly pointed to the prophets, to Christ, of the saints. 
And what they pointed to was the yes or no spiritual choice that true sanctity always insists upon. What clarity, what Dorothy and Peter bring, therefore, is clarity. And that's what the gospel always brings. Clarity as to what the really real is. The Constantinian era is dead. We must now return to that fervor of those first Christians who refused to accede to Caesar's occupation of every space. For them, the acclamation, Jesus is Lord, was more than a doxological prayer. It was also a dangerous and potentially lethal affirmation that Caesar is not Lord. On both the right and the left, the church in America and Europe is defaced with the greedy of our vulgar preoccupations and seems no longer to have the spiritual resources to even desire something more Christ-centered. In earlier eras, reform was possible despite corruption and spiritual laxity because people still knew where and what the center was, the Christ presented in the Gospels. Today, even in the church, there are those who doubt the legitimacy of even having a center. Viewing the very notion of a center as hegemonic and lacking in inclusion, which of course is merely code for we want our bourgeois comforts and conceits. And so we, so we see we're not so opposed to centers after all. Mammon suffers no rivals. And some people might react to these words and call them harsh and judgmental, perhaps even self-righteous. They might say, I'm describing at best only the worst case examples and at worst a straw man caricature. But this is just laying down smoke in order to create a fog that allows us to evade the obvious. This is the typical response every prophet like Dorothy and Peter receives when they call out a culture. Think of Jeremiah. In fact, the very word Jeremiah means a form of denunciatory rhetoric that is often over the top and is in reality an insult to the prophet Jeremiah. I'm not claiming to be a prophet, and I'm not a prophet. But I am claiming that Dorothy and Peter were, and I am pointing out as the observations they made about the church of their time applies in equal measure to our time as well. Thus we are confronted with a choice, and so we must choose. A purely contractual Catholicism will not suffice since it does not possess the spiritual depths needed to hold off the relentless degradation of our sense of God and the cult of well-being. We might think that we can have our cake and eat it too, that we can be a kind of halfway Catholic while keeping both feet firmly planted in the worldview of modernity, that we can pass on the faith to our children by simply making, taking them to church once in a while, but we will be fooling ourselves. The beige Catholicism that Bishop Robert Barron describes as the boilerplate default position of the average suburban parish is not compelling, is not beautiful, and is viewed by many as a boring and drab affair that simply cannot compete with the more exciting imaginative allurements of the modern world. It simply does not grip, it does not bite, it does not gain any traction, and it does not challenge us to the kind of sanctified heroism which alone can excite the soul. Youth is a time for idealism, for just such heroism. And yet we generally do not tap into this deep reservoir of desire for meaning and purpose among the young and opt instead for a church of Monte Carlo night fundraisers and basket rabbles to build community. Not that there's anything wrong with raising money, but when your whole community is revolving around those things, it's, it's, it's a bad sign. Homilies that are atrociously dull and anodyne filled with the kind of obvious moralisms that do not require the faith to affirm. It's nice to be nice to the nice, is the theme of most of them. Even if lip service is paid to the deeper demands of the gospel in cursory ways that are left so vague and open-ended as to mean absolutely nothing. Homilies that advance a vision of moral existence that is scarcely more than what I learned from my second grade teacher about lunch line etiquette. Homilies that are boring, drab, soul-killing, and quite frankly, utterly jejune and nugatory. What we need, and what I say need, and I say this as a layperson, is, a, is absolutely necessary and non-negotiable are parishes that confront the culture and attempt to flip the script of modernity's narrative, all the while making it clear that fence-sitting, bet-hedging Catholicism is not Catholicism. The choice, the Anstfall moment, needs to be spelled out clearly and presented as an attractive, imaginative, joyous, countercultural option that compels for the sheer beauty of its truth and goodness. But the choice is rarely presented, and instead we have settled into a kind of quiet resignation to the banality of it all. We hold diocesan synods, ooh, we're having a synod, with fancy titles like renewing the faith in spirit. But in reality, all they usually turn out to be are discussions of how many and which parishes to close and consolidate. We retreat and consolidate and call it renewal. We know it for what it is, defeat. 
And in the midst of that fading, that defeat, it's nothing but a debilitating indifference to the things of God. Ratzinger's blunt analysis of the situation already in 58 and then in 67 caused him to conclude in a manner radically similar to that of Peter Morin and Dorothy Day that the only path forward is the path of demolition, followed by a reconstruction that will be a revolution of the heart and the path of holiness. Ratzinger states, quote, in the long run, the church cannot escape having to dismantle bit by bit its semblance of worldliness to become, to become again what she is, a community of believers. That is Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict. That is not a call to a sectarian withdrawal into some imagined pristine community of the pure. We're not talking here about becoming modern-day Catholic Essenes, squirreled away somewhere in a Catholic compound, complete with a buried school bus stockpiled with catechisms and blessed sacramentals of guns and grenades embossed with an image of St. Michael wielding an Uzi or something, skirts for the ladies that go below the knees. It's rather a call to a radical conversion as the only path forward, since the only credibility the church possesses is her holiness. And this radical conversion and the credibility that will follow in its wake is in the service of the church's engagement with and missionary outreach to the world. This is Ratzinger's point. Therefore, Ratzinger finally concludes, quote, only when it ceases to be an easy matter of course, only when it begins to present itself again as what it is, Will it be able to get its message across to the new heathens who at present indulge the illusion that they are not heathens at all? I love that he used the word heathens. Who talks like that? <laughs> no, nobody. Heathens. Woo. <laughs> Scary stuff there. All right. Returning then to the council and Dorothy Day's relevance to it, another problem was that even though it gave us something like a theology of tradition and its revamping of the theology of revelation in a Christocentric center, it didn't give us a proper hermeneutic or theory of interpretation for adjudicating just how that Christocentrism translated into various doctrines and so on, so forth, <coughs> and how, more important, how they can develop or change. The council, as I said before, engaged in certain micro-ruptures with what it considered to be distortions of the tradition and sought to restore balance to certain areas of teaching. Examples would include its affirmation of religious freedom of a fundamental, as a fundamental human right which include then a further rejection of past church teaching on the uses of forceful means of coercion in the religious domain, up to and including burning heretics at the stake. A doctrine which comes as a shock to many Catholics when they discover that there was a time when the church during the Counter-Reformation actually condemned the idea that it's wrong to burn heretics at the stake. So there's a little change there. I'd say there's a micro-rupture, a little tiny micro-rupture. There were changes in the theological concept of the rights of bishops vis-a-vis -vis the papacy. In other words, Pope's not a monarch, bishops are not his vassals. Changes in the notion of the possibility of salvation for non-Christians, and guess what? They're not all going to hell. And changes in church's approach to modern scripture scholar, scholarship and so on. <coughs> I could continue, but you get the point. But as Monsignor Thomas Guarino, who teaches at Seton Hall, points out in his book, The Disputed Teachings of Vatican II, the conciliar reluctance to openly admit to reversals of previous teachings constituted a kind of masking of the true state of affairs out of a pastoral concern that the integrity of the magisterium not be called into question by average believers. The bishops at Vatican II were deeply reluctant to challenge explicitly the reigning ecclesial narrative that all developments of doctrine in the history of the church, including at Vatican II, are organic, smooth, and in full material continuity with all that came before. However, considering that Vatican II did reverse certain prior teachings, and the Council Fathers knew darn well that they were, does this not constitute a kind of deception on their part? No, no. Because even though the Council did not explicitly challenge the narrative of total material continuity, they didn't, they didn't affirm it either. They simply let it sit. And sadly, their failure to develop a proper hermeneutic of how to retrieve the tradition they were changing even if that failure was motivated by sincere beliefs about not crushing the bruised reed. I think that was the single big, biggest mistake theologically and even pastorally speaking made by the council because it left the door wide open for others in the post-conciliar era to fill that void and to propose a hermeneutic of rupture as the key motif of the council, a rupture they viewed as so extreme that everything was now up for reinterpretation. 
Therefore, the so-called spirit of Vatican II, many of you might be old enough to remember that, so often invoked by the progressive wing of the post-conciliar church, find its theological grounding in both what the council actually did and reversing some small teachings, but also more importantly in what the council did not say. Here's what it means and this is what you can and can't do and so on. It didn't say that. So the failure of the council to achieve its stated aim of a new springtime in the church can be tied directly to this this missing piece in its interpretive apparatus. And it is a missing piece that proved fatal to its entire resource monitor return to the sources project of renewal. <clears throat> Since the various reversals of the council left hanging without conceptual contextualization in a broader theological development <clears throat> had political consequences in the church that were of the very kind the council hoped to avoid by not addressing the topic in the first place, fail. And that brings me at last to what I call, what I've sort of developed, I call it the hermeneutics of kenosis. Hermeneutics of kenosis. Kenosis is a Greek word that means to descend, as Christ descended into the form of a slave, according to St. Paul. <clears throat> In order to understand what I mean by this term, it is necessary to grasp the essence of what has become known as what we call resource mont theology, which... It, Literally, the term means a resourcing, as in a return to the original source of the church's tradition, the scriptures, the church fathers in particular. But this is all too often misunderstood as a desire to do a kind of end run around the medievals and the entire scholastic tradition, which isn't true. Fortunately, that is not what the resourcement guys were doing. They emphasized instead the patristic era not to engage in a sort of patristic fundamentalism, but in order to broaden the church's horizons. <clears throat> to place the medievals and the scholastics and Aquinas within a broader context, not the straitjacket that they had been placed within. And that latter point is key. Resourcement thinkers, such as Balthazar, Ratzinger, de Lubach, did not want to repristinate anything, since such pro projects evince a romanticized form of thinking that borders on the antiquarian. Rather, what they sought was something far more radical, the reinterrogation of the entire tradition in order to recenter revelation Christologically. What these thinkers sought was a form of theology that evinced a creative originality that was not a modern innovation, but was truly radical as something deeply traditional can be. What they sought was no, not so much a scholarly retrieval as it was the pursuit of a form of pastoral revitalization, all right, that they thought neo-scholasticism did not have the capacity to do. Therefore, we see this still today in the casual dismissal of Vatican II by the so-called many radical traditionalists, they say, oh, it's merely pastoral counsel, so we can just ignore it, because after all, it was just pastoral. Right? It had no new canons, it, asked, it issued no new anathemas, oh, the horror, a council that issued no anathemas, and proffered no new dogmas, oh my. But in so dismissing the council, they display a profound ignor ignorance of the problem problematic at hand namely the divorce between theology and holiness, doctrine and praxis, the pastoral and the dogmatic, that had plagued the church for centuries, in which the very pastoral nature of the church was seeking to address. In other words, it is my claim that the pastoral nature of the council's theology is precisely the theological point of doctrine that the council was affirming. Seen in this light, the resourcement theologians were the most radically traditionalist of all the conciliar contenders and the council itself, far from being a rupture with tradition in the deeper and more radical sense of that word, was perhaps the most traditionalist culture, a council in centuries. Ultimately, this depth that is sought is nothing other than Christ himself, the ultimate source of race or smut. And any liturgical reform or catechetical teaching or papal bull must stay strictly with that Christological form. That is what I call the hermeneutics of kenosis. Any doctrine, no matter how long it has been taught, that falls short of the Christological canon of kenosis is a distortion. Any liturgical form or catechetical teaching or papal bull, as I just said, that falls short of that canon of kenosis is a distortion. The resource month thinkers were not seeking a patristic revival as an end in itself. What they sought was a patristic revival that retrieved in some sense the freshness of that kenosis, of that Christocentrism of the fathers. 
And De Veribum makes this very clear. But how do we judge when a doctrine or practice is Christological enough? First of all, we need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, gifted to us as a charism related to faith, which creates within us a connatural sympathy with the Christological form. A deep dive into scripture is needed, as well as attention to all of the deep elements of the tradition. The saints and the doctors of the church are critical here, as well as the liturgy, the creeds, and explicit dogmatic teachings. There's no magic bullet of super clarity, and ambiguities and, and debates will remain. How could they not? Our minds rise to God asymptotically, and the greater dissimilarity abides. St. Augustine said, si comprehendis non es Deus. If you can comprehend it, it's not God. The goal of dogmas and lesser doctrines is not the elimination of mystery, but it's accentuation. We are blinded not by darkness, but by an excess of light. And dogmas are only vessels of that light and not the light itself. All the great saints knew this as well. The closer we get to God, the more we know that, that it, it is that we do not know. And the more we see, the more we are aware of our blindness. In this whole process of hermeneutical retrieval, therefore, there is no substitute for prayer and holiness. This is my point of how Dorothy connects to all of this. What the council was proposing was a Christological hermeneutic. No forensic sort of dicing and slicing of doctrines and this neo-scholastic verbiage or other. It wanted to ground them in Christ, which means in kenosis, which means in holiness, which links the universal call to holiness directly, directly to the doctrinal developments it was championing. Which is why I say Dorothy Day was a precursor of Vatican II. She and Peter Morn, who saw and fought for a lay revolution in the church of universal holiness, were well ahead of our time, not in some pietistical, fluffy sense of holy card, hallmark niceness, but in this radical, hard-hitting sense. Therefore, the only true hermeneutic is the hermeneutic of kenosis, or as Pope Benedict puts it, the hermeneutic of the cross. This hermeneutic of the divine life revealed by Christ, this kenosis. Dorothy Day understood this. And in, in Dorothy Day, I see a perfect example of which in my view, God, God always raises up saints who are specific, the specific antidote to the errors of the times. Not a traditionalist, not a progressive, not a Marxist, not a conservative, not a liberal. She was a Christian to her core and a Catholic one at that. And she was a saint in my view. We need a serious living out of the Sermon on the Mount, she said, most especially in its call to love our enemies, since ours is an increasingly balkanized culture of ritualized hatreds. We need lay saints who can show us how to live sanctified lives in the world. And that means saints who imitate the pattern of divine kenosis or divine descent of divine charity in their own lives in the form of a radical solidarity with the hell that so many people live within but so live that hell and solidarity with it as its own descent that is not overcome by the hell that it experiences, but transforms it from within. And that is precisely the kind of saint that Dorothy Day was, is. A saint that is a witness to the holiness of the laity living in today's sad world of despair and broken pieces. Tyranny rises in exact proportion to the loss of real community and real culture. The COVID pandemic, the war in Ukraine, the rise of racial tensions here at home, in at home, the surge of desperate immigrants fleeing conditions in their own countries that our own country helped to create, the rise of poverty and unemployment, and the rise of an even scarier militarism now extending into space, cry out for the anti-politics politics of the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom, which is not of this world, but is for this world. And that is the politics of Dorothy. We should, therefore, it's, it's an anarchism in its own way, as she called it. We should therefore be saints who see that ours is a time of expectant, expectant preparation for the inbreaking of that kingdom in the form of the divine love displayed in the events of the Paschal Mystery. There is no issue stronger than the tissue of love and no need so holy as the palm outstretched in the run of generosity. And it is only this divine love, expressed as Dorothy taught an endless hospitality and open-ended forgiveness in intentional communities of Christian holiness and faith, that can build our communities back again and save us from the noose of techno-capitalist militarist tyranny 
that is around our necks. President Biden proposes we build back better. All he really means, of course, is what all presidents ever mean. Trump, Obama, all of them. Give my party more power. But to really build back better, we first need to subvert the old order. Therefore, in order for that to happen in this current season of crisis, let our prayer be. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones, and he has lifted up the lowly, as we sang tonight at Vespers. And that is what Dorothy Day did in her own, in her own small way. She resisted and she loved. Nay, her resistance was a form of love. Only then can the church regain her credibility in the world. Nothing else will suffice. Not more meetings or stratagems or pastoral plans or synods or position papers from the bishops on topics over which they have no competence. The competence of our pastors is the fostering of holiness. Raw, brutal, extreme, crazy as a mad hatter, holiness. The holiness that causes people to stop short and ask, what the heck is that? To be different, insanely insane. The church of Petrine structure is no longer held to be credible in our world. We need to make it credible by living our hermeneutics of kenosis in our own lives and live the example of Dorothy and Peter, which will provide the church with our only proper metric rooted in the practice for making doctrinal formulations and for settling doctrinal disputes. Because devotion to Christ is a deeper metric of truth in the debates versus or of orthodoxy versus heresy. Robert Wilkin makes that point, and he's a very orthodox theologian. Finally, in conclusion, aren't you happy to hear that? The fact that the church may have committed errors in the past bothers me not one bit. I lose no sleep over it, and it does not engender in me a crisis of faith. Little children that are tortured and raped and then murdered by some sick sadist causes me far more existential dread than the fact that some pope once taught some howler of nonsense. And this is what Dorothy Day understood as well, which is why she believed that there is nothing so holy as charity. The teaching of Vatican II on religious freedom as well as some of the other teachings of Vatican II, has caused a deep existential crisis of faith for many radical traditionalists and others. But they are like a person adrift at sea who spies a, a rock jutting out from the water, and as they seek to cling to it, they curse the slippery moss that covers it. But it is a rock in the ocean, and so of course it has moss on it. Better to find that floating beam of wood, that thin arboreal presence, which alone stands between us and the abyss below, and upon which our Savior, the only Savior, once hung. Thank you. Dorothy Day, pray for us.